This evening, we have two speakers, and I'd like to introduce the first one first, and we'll have him go on for a bit, and then we will introduce our second speaker. And this evening, I was fortunate enough to notice on LinkedIn, I do pay attention to social media some of the time, that Dave was offering himself during this yesterday and today, the, the Monday and Tuesday of this week, before he continues with some previously scheduled activities later in the week. And so I said, would you like to come and tell us at Beitai about this workshop that you have put together? So, Dave Maloff may be well known to some of you as a leader and a uh, longtime participant in IXDA, the Interaction Design Association. And for those of you who don't know him, please meet Dave IXD. <laughs> Hi everyone. Is my mic on now? Yes, your mic is. I am on? All right. Yeah, yeah there we go. Yeah. I can hear me now. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for asking me, Nancy. Uh, so this is me. Some of you may have only seen me as Dave IXD before on the Twitters. Um, and this is, uh, even though I lived in the Bay Area for a bit, this is my first time actually attending and speaking here. So it's kind of cool. Um, so we're here to talk about design operations or what some people have been calling design ops. I try to avoid the phrase DevOps um, because it's too close to DevOps and it's just confusing. So, yes, you have to say all the syllables of design, design ops. So first, I want to talk a little bit about how I got to design ops because it helps frame things. And um, how I got here was really about resistance. What was I resisting? I was resisting agile. Um, so pretty much my entire career has been one where um, Agile just was not working. And everyone told me it worked and was not working wherever I was and I didn't know how and didn't know why. So I had this whole thing about, whole sort of thing about Agile and, and Lean and all of that. Um, I think I've come around a little bit in my time um, to appreciate and understand some of its values. Um, the other part of me is studio culture. So um, while I'm not a, I'm not a like design school designer. Like I, my degree is in anthropology. I did hunt out and search design culture, um, the design school version of it or classic design version, and became kind of a zealot of these aspects of design culture, um, of studio culture. Uh, and then once I became a professor of design at the Savannah College of Art and Design, I was using it and teaching it and living it on a regular basis and became even more of an advocate. But, but, okay. but um, because of the agile thing and the studio culture thing, I kind of felt like there was this round uh, whole square peg thing going on, um, that they weren't really fitting together. And when you look at um, studio culture on one side, and modern agile on the other side, um, they both have great values. Um, sometimes those values feel like they're in opposition. Opposition might be too strong of a word, but like they're, they're creating friction with each other. And so uh, this has been something I've been thinking a lot about uh, as I become a design, as I've moved into design leadership. And I've figured out for myself with all the things that I've been working on, that where I have been and what I have seen in talking to others, this idea of understanding how can we amplify the value of design in an organization is what interested me. But that's really at the heart of, of what I'm trying to do as a design leader, what I'm all about. That the craft of design was interesting to me, but it wasn't something I was truly expert at compared to others. But as being a design leader, this idea of moving design value and amplifying that value um, was forward. And that's where design ops came from for me. And there's many sources for design ops. I'm like just one voice in a choir. Um, there's delivery, there's community management, program management, dev ops, design systems, uh, and human resources, product management. All of these bring a little bit of flavor into design ops and a little bit of influence. And design ops has been on, been this growing kind of bubbly thing that most people have never heard of, sort of like talking about interaction design in 1999. And, you know, 
why now? Like, why, why are people talking about it now? Why am I talking about it now? What's different? What's changed? And that thing that has really changed is scale. Um, there's a lot of things that have scaled. So one of the this list of things are what's scaling all around us. Um, so whether it's just our team sizes, right? Um, how many people in the room work on an, in an organization where there are more than 10 designers? Like, why are you raising your hand, right? <laughs> more than 20 designers. More than 100 designers. Maria, raise your hand, come on. <laughs> Maria works for Apple, so I'm like, why are you raising your hand? But there are plenty of organizations out there, whether it's, um, whether it's some of the big classic things like Google or Facebook or LinkedIn or Pinterest, whatever, that have just been scaling and scaling and scaling uh, to over 100 designers, if not hundreds of designers, IBM being the classic, we've hired 1,500 designers in a year um, kind of organization, or HPE had 600 designers across all 300,000 employees uh, when, I, when I was there. But we're scaling our teams, the number of teams. So out of those uh, places, they don't have one design team that's 600 or 1,000 people. They're like these teams. They're like groups, and they're not really connected all the time. Um, so the complexity uh, of making things consistent, if there's, that's even a value of an organization, becomes difficult. The number of systems that need to be connected and designed together is why we have so many teams, but also adds a layer of complication of what we're trying to scale, what we're trying to scale in what we design. And the last thing is uh, that I'll say is just the type and number of integrations. And those integrations just aren't in the systems that um, we're designing, but they're actually integrations in the system that we design with, right? So my Slack, takes in all kinds of information from all kinds of things, like Jira, or Asana, or Trello. Um, it even has calls from, uh, from various tools, like uh, Azure, you can say there was a change to, and it goes into a bot in Slack. But then there's also like plug-in architectures between Sketch, and Envision, and Craft, and um, Abstract, and all of these other things that designers didn't really deal with too much previously. Yeah, Adobe sort of had extensions as a possibility, but now you're having intercompany things going on in a way, and partnerships that weren't before, which is making our ecosystem of our tools and workflows more complex. When I talk about what is um, design ops, we have to talk about what isn't design ops first in a way. And what isn't design ops is the designing, the verb of designing, right? And it's that craft, um, methods and process. And one of the things where we're at is we know this stuff. We don't have to talk about craft methods and process anymore, right? Like that's sort of known and maybe we need to teach it to people who don't know it, but we've kind of solidified all of this stuff. And we're now at the level of maturity where we need to start talking about other things. We need to start talking about this layer. We need to start talking about workflow. We need to start talking about the people. We need to start talking about governance. It's a big issue that we don't talk a lot about. And finally, the tools and infrastructure. Um, a lot of design organizations have been like, bring your own tool and use whatever's great. Or it's been like very dogmatic, we only have license for this. Neither one of those actually work at scale. Um, they're both problematic at a certain level. Um, so you need to make decisions about these things. But even under this, there's another layer which informs the operational layer, right? And that's the culture, basically. So you have values, you have principles, and a mission, maybe add a vision into that. And these cultural layers kind of are supporting the foundation around your operations. Design operations main goal, or any operational goal, is to set things up for success. And this isn't only design operations, all operations do this, right? Um, but we want to increase the value of design, which means that how we think about operations for design needs to be different than how we think about it for marketing or how we think about it for engineering, right? These are different organizations with different needs. But one of the largest obstacles, since these are integrated organizations, that goes on in making design ops or any part of the design organization successful 
is that the value of design itself is misaligned in its understanding across an organization. That there are very few organizations where you can go into a team that's made up of designers, engineers, and product management, or whatever you call it, program management, or project management, whatever you call it, and marketing, and go, can you tell me what the value of design is to this organization, to your team, and get the same answer? Anywhere close to the same answer. And I would even beg to say that most of the teams that I've been on, even the teams that I've led regretfully, that even the designers themselves don't have the same answer for why they are a value to the organization that they're working for, right? And so this to me is one of the biggest problems that design is facing is we understand what engineering does for an organization, but we don't really understand what we want out of designing in an organization. Yes, we want artifacts that lead to certain outcomes, but we don't understand the value of designing and what it takes to be a designer and how that value is different than others. When we talk about value, what are we trying to answer? We're trying to answer the question of why should I even, why should I come to you? Why am I coming to you? What solution am I giving? Um, why am I going to invest in you? And how do I even measure the success of that investment in the first place? I have four propositions of where I think the value of designing comes in. I'm not saying this is like the end all be all. It's just things that I know that I value about design and the things that I've seen where design has brought the most value in the organizations where it's been effective. So the first thing is driving understanding and empathy. Um, this may be like if you want to bring in Indy Young, she would talk about cognitive empathy and emotional empathy, but I like the word understanding. Uh, do we understand people um, in the world around us, both the ones we're working with and the ones we're working for out in the world? Um, designers are great at creating clarity, generally. When we think about visual design, it brings clarity to the world when it's done well. When we think about interaction design, its main purpose is behavioral fit. Both the fit of what the behaviors are that exist in the world, but then also the outcome of the interaction design is creating new behaviors that then fit and manifest the new world. Right? This is what designers do, is we create clarity and that fit. Our mode of operation of designing is one through exploration, not really through experimentation. It's not one where we say, okay, here's a vial of water, let me add a little bit of salt, let me add a little bit of more salt, and give the observational result. That's the way lean methods are working, and that's fine, and there's value into that version, that version of increment and experiment that's important. But what designing offers is exploration. Not only am I gonna have a vial of water, but I'm gonna say, well, what if I put oil in it? What if I put magne magnesium in it? What if I put copper in it? What if I did, what if I did, what if I did? And then increment along all of those. And maybe I'm gonna put copper and salt and magnesium together. And I'm sure for any of the chemists in the room, I've created a nuclear bomb. But that's not the point. The point is we're about exploring the possibilities. And then from those possibilities moving forward. And the last one is envisioning. That where design's real success is, is in imagining a whole future and then figuring out what we need to do to get there. That we are a deconstructive practice, not a constructive practice. So if anyone's ever seen that classic, you know, the building of the car or the skateboard to the car image, those are both, those are both versions of construction, right? What they haven't done is said, well, where's the image of the car, since both ended with a car, with a highway or a road or a parking lot or whatever, and that's what the designer brings, and then says, puts a person in the middle of it, hopefully, and says, okay, in order to get there, what do we need to do? Here's our future, and we envision that, and we bring that vision to life. So maybe we feel a little bit of empathy, and maybe we understand at the same time. But it's that process of envisioning that we do through the visual skills and through storytelling skills. So, in my research around design ops, um, I've noticed that there's these three major lenses. So if you look out into the world and you search design operations on LinkedIn for jobs, 
First of all, you'll get very few results. Don't make it a career choice yet. But um, there's three basic schools. There's school, which is very workflow or delivery oriented, which I put under here, workflow operations. There's another school, which is very much about people operations, human resources, community management, things like that up here. And then there's folks which are about business operations. How do I work with the rest? How does my design team work with the rest of the business organization? Right? But as each, or each um, design operations organization or person matures, they start spreading over into everything else. And all of this ends up being design operations in the more mature organizations running design operations or design operations. They end up taking it all. But because they take it all, just like when any organization or any new thing starts from a single point, it always favors it because it's familiar, because it's more mature for them or they're more mature with it. And so when you look at the job ad, it's going to be for workflow management, it's going to seem like it's program management or design management using the language of Cap One. Um, if you're going to see people operations, it's going to look like community management or a practice lead of some kind that's focused on the people. And when you see biz ops, it may be like a chief of staff, right? And that kind of role. And they all sort of tell you what their vision was when they started. Now, if you are interested in figuring out where you're at operationally in your design team, the folks at Explain and a bunch of us at the Design Ops Summit really focused on coming up with a canvas that we thought would be a working tool. Um, I'm going to skip a bunch of slides because I've got enough time. <laughs> um, but what, <clears throat> if you go and I can give you the URL um, later, it's totally public, open source. You can do what you want with it. But by any canvas, like a lean canvas or a value proposition canvas, externalizing it and working with teams, um, you really get to the therapy part of figuring out how to do the org design that you need to do. So that's really my talk for tonight. Um, we're going to do hopefully a longer Q&A. Um, but I do want to end because today is kind of a special day. Uh, today, the folks at Envisioned, who I worked with for quite a bit, um, brought together a bunch of people with design ops titles or design ops experience. And we just launched today this new book on design operations, the Design Ops Handbook. And since you're not, thank you. Um, and since you're not uh, seeing a URL, well, we need a URL. So there you go. Wait, wait, what happened? No URL. Oh, I know why. Oh, keynote. There's URL. So it's just um, the folks at uh, Envision also have this organization called designbetter.co where you can get lots of information about how you can design better. Um, they're doing a lot of good education work. Uh, on that general site. Um, and that's all I've got for this short little thing. Um, before we jump into the Q&A, I will say that uh, the green badge here is because I'm looking to help organizations do this um, anywhere around the world, but anywhere is anywhere. So uh, anyway, that's it for me. Great, so let's take some questions. Yes, ma'am. Loose. At the top. <laughs> Making Nancy work for it. Uh, and you said at the beginning that this all started with opposition to agile. Okay. Resistance to agile or was the word I used. <laughs> but uh, I think I, where's the connection to then come up with design of? Because, I mean, agile is kind of structured and there is a process and I think you can actually embed your design operation quite well in it. You, it takes work. So where I think, um, where I think it kind of comes apart is, that comes apart, where I think it becomes difficult is uh, where Agile has traditionally been deployed, um, which is not really what I would call modern Agile uh, today, um, people have been really advancing Agile in really great ways lately. Uh, but even then, um, these values of being constructive versus deconstructive. So let's say I wanted, to use, um, I wanted to use a Scrum model within my Agile team, right? 
Uh, it's probably the most popular version of Agile that we deal with. Um, it's very open, it's very, it's very flexible. However, it is purely constructive in the way that it's set up, in the way that you have an epic and you have stories that build that epic. Um, it's uh, time boxing everyone equally, right? Everyone's time boxed the same exact way, regardless of what kind of activity or work that they're doing, which isn't, it, it treats everyone as the same. And designers do things differently than engineers. They're not the same people. They're not the same role. They're not the same activities. And that's really my struggle, that's really where my struggle with Agile has been, is that it wants everyone to work the exact same way. And that's, that to me is where the resistance has been. The other resistance is that most Agile organizations, and everyone will tell me this, is like, you're not upset with Agile, you're upset with bad Agile, right? And so, if 90% of what is out there in the world is bad Agile, I'm, ba I'm mad at Agile. Right? Like, we can't just say that, like, the four organizations that are doing Agile right define Agile. That doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, and so, they probably should just call it something else if that's what they're doing. If, like, if you're only 2% of something or 5%, then call it something else. Like, Netflix should not be calling it Agile if, or Spotify. They should be calling it something else if they are the prototypical example because no one is everyone is bastardizing and corrupting Agile in their organizations because they aren't changing the culture of the organization that they're building Agile on top of. So with the modern approaches to Agile, do you think it better. fits better to designers? Or to yeah, the because modern Agile, modern Agile fits because the people who I have seen speaking and writing about modern Agile are collaborative and balanced in their approach. And that to me is the core, mm -hmm. right? It's not, hey, we're engineering and we're gonna tell you how to do Agile, which is 90% of the companies that designers are embedded in. Mm -hmm. You use our system, not, hey, let's create the right system together based on this values system. And that's the way modern Agilists are approaching um, how to create an Agile structure together, where most organizations are like, this designers, you're secondary and you're gonna go in that direction. In an article I wrote recently, I made the provocative statement that um, uh, engineering is an oppressive force to design. Definitely and so and the reason that I say that is, the reason that I say that to explain it is, engineers take the privilege of language as their own. And they don't try to create a new language by which we're all equal with. So just the same way that we use appropriation within other cultural structures, work is a cultural structure, and it has a balance that is in place. And until we figure out how to do it as balanced, as opposed to this is the language that we have to use because we came up with it and there's 20 of us to every one of you, then it's, yes, it's an oppressive force. Yeah, hi. So um, during your talk, I got this kind of vague feeling of bureaucracy. Right? Hope not. When, Sorry. You're, when you're talking here, you're talking about you know, collaboration and balance. This, you know, the, the, this, this last thing you were talking about was exciting also. And I just wonder, you know, examples or, or I, yeah, it's, I, I, I kind of want to understand how it's not a big HR move. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, one thing I would say is that design operations is not limited to the workflow piece. And I would call agile being in the workflow component. So let's be broader about that for a sec. Um, but in, in talking about that, um, you can have an organization that is, um, classic organization I just came from, we were, um, we were a team of designers, all centralized together, kept apart from the engineering organization. Um, we were each assigned to a team, but kept outside that team. Um, we were um, invited to the workflow Slack channel, but not the engineering Slack channel. And they did their stand-ups in the engineering Slack channel, right? Um, hopefully, 
what a reorg or what a design operator will come to do, um, a program manager of some sort will come to do is improve those communication lines, right? So if you think of just, if you think of it, if you think bureaucracy is adding a person, um, you don't even need to add a person. What you do need is to add somebody who can be thoughtful about the mindset of being a design operator. And at lower scales, right, at five, 10, it should be the design manager, design director, who is also the operational leader. It's when you get above 20 or 40 or 50, depending on the organization, um, when you start having design managers in between a director, um, that you need to start splitting the attention between strategic and vision leadership and operational and business leadership as separate roles. Does that help? So there is some middle management at certain scale, but I wouldn't call it bureaucratic. I would call it delegation of responsibilities and, sk and, and skills. There's just different skills. And while someone may have enough of the skill at lower scale in order to do it, there's a point at which they need to start specializing to be better, to be good enough. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, great presentation. So uh, your presentation and about talking about design ops reminded me of design strategy, which is what I did my master's in. Did you ever, like, uh, did you use this, the design strategy as a reference or are there overlaps in there? I'm really interested to <laughs> learn more. Well, to me, to, to be good at design ops is strategic, yeah. right? Like, especially when you look at the people side of things, yeah. where you're really looking about how you hire, how you develop and build teams, how you organize those teams structurally. When you look at the business ops side, I remember um, when I was at Rackspace, my uh, first manager, um, from the get-go, he was like, you know, we have to get our own IT organization for the design team because we're just getting too many no's from the global IT organization and we couldn't get the infrastructure that we wanted, right? And so the real answer there is how do we get what we need? How do we teach IT to not be a no organization but to be an empowering organization, right? Which means you have to take on a different role for yourself. How do you create those relationships um, and be strategic, but you also need to have, any time to be strategic, you need to be towards something. There needs to be a vector to be moving towards. Right. Thank you. So just to throw a, a third buzzword in here to the conversation. Oh, more buzzwords. <laughs> yeah. So we got design ops, we got uh, design strategy, and how do you relate all this to design thinking? Another local buzzword here. <laughs> it's not local, to, not local here. Uh, the, the, the people in the campus next door would like you to think so. Um, <laughs> people in Toronto would think otherwise. Um, so I would say um, it's agnostic to it. You can use design thinking as a tool to solve design operations problems. I would recommend it because I like it, but you can also you not use design thinking. But I tend to think of like I actually think of design operations as the service designing of your design organization, right? Um, I tend not to think about design thinking too much as a, as a concept in general, um, but I like things like service design as enablements and um, structures or service architectures. So I do do service architectures in, in my work as a, as a consultant for design ops. Think, thinking of, I think thinking about design thinking is, is design meta thinking. That, that's what you call that. But um, the, I think there's a, um, not to go too far into this, this rat hole, but the, the uh, design thinking, big picture, is um, you know, infecting business people with design. Like, like putting design, the way design is done on the table of the way business is done. Uh, at the top level, that, I mean that, um, that's sort of the ideological purpose of it, I think, as I understand it from the outside. Um, the, it seems like this is a little bit of the opposite of that, which is kind of putting, infecting business thinking into the minds of design people. Like, in other words, in a way, yeah. you can't just be creative or right. know about flows or icons or something. You have to figure out how to get things done and be operation, operationalize your ideas. Um, the thing I think that threw me off for a long time was that it kept 
it seemed like it kept getting compared to DevOps. And to me, DevOps is... I did that once, too. Is we don't have, you know, DevOps is now we do our own IT on the engineering team, which is very different from a COO of engineering versus, because this sounds like a COO of design. Like, yep. in big companies, often there's an operational partner to the executive mm -hmm. lead. And, yeah. you know, and, and this, that's what it mostly sounds like to me. And, and that's the way I think of it. Um, I was talking to somebody on, with the announcement of the book this morning, chatter or whatnot, and one person said, well, the book misses the point because the book doesn't talk about code, right? And I was just like, oy vey. And I wrote back to him and I was like, well, not all design has code. Design is actually agnostic of technology. And um, he wrote back and he said, well, design still has to deliver value. I'm like, totally agree. Design still has to deliver value, but that value is not necessarily in code. But he, in his lens, is probably coming from that workflow lens of how do I get my designing to integrate, like, and I talk about in other things about the API of the, your design organization, right? And there's plenty of people doing amazing work in, in design systems, um, really advancing, you know, how to get design to be thinking like a DevOps, to be taking some of those value systems. I was at an organization in Germany and I was blown away because like they came to me because they thought that they were immature in some of these areas, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like all even across the organization. And somebody who was working on their design system stood up and said, yeah, we actually created a tool whereby we can do a diff differential between our different like we can put a new CSS up and we can compare the last version to the new version and it will only tell us that it's different, right? We can't tell if it's right just from that, like the AI is not quite there yet, but we can tell that it's different and now we know to put attention on it. And I'm like, oh my God, that's like 90% of the problem way there in terms of doing that kind of development work and doing that self QA that is a big part of, of a DevOps system, right? Um, and making it speedier and and, and to learning, obviously. So there are organizations pushing that. I that think it's really interesting. One more. Last one, it better be good. Um, so the slide you've got up here uh, showing the distinctions between studio culture and modern agile um, remind me a bit of the distinction between, say, the theoretical physicists and the experimental physicists. You know, the one on the left is all about finding solutions. The one on the right is about building things. Um, and you said earlier um, that it's important to clarify de design's value proposition. Designing's value proposition. Designing's value proposition. Uh, and you know the main value might be in terms of empathy and clarity and exploration and envisioning. I see you were taking notes. Right. I certainly was, because uh, this, this is valuable stuff. I'm, I'm absolutely eating this up. Um, so my question is, in my past experience, the people on the engineering side have failed to find any value in things like empathy and clarity and exploration. Mm -hmm. um, do you Been have there. any favorite strategies for overcoming that particular resistance? Um. Well, my question to you is how much direct contact do your engineers have with the people who are using what they build? Yes. Generally, very little. Right, and so that would be my tactic, <laughs> which would be to get them as close as possible to the people who are using what they build, right? Whether that is getting them on the support lines, hey, do a week on the support phones, or take support tickets, be the lead engineer on support instead of being the lead engineer on building for a while, right? That would be like the first thing. And that's not even direct contact with customers. That's just getting into the ticket queue, right? And a, in a much more direct way than your average build teams are. Um, the next thing I would say is um, get them into the testing or in, out into the field. Um, when I was at HPE, there was this one group from Colorado that amazed me that they were able to get their engineers into the field. Um, they had this agreement, and this is HPE, uh, if anyone just down the road here, like it's, it's the most engineering-centric organization I ever worked in, and I also worked at Motorola, which I thought was pretty engineering-centric. So it's like, 
they thought they knew it all, yet they were still willing to take that chance. And how do you get them to take that chance? It's evangelism, it's um, sharing what research you have, putting videos in front of them, doing really good storytelling, um, but also f you- And pizza, don't forget pizza. Or sweets, I prefer oh. sweets. Just That's the difference between I, a savory sweet. Yeah, so um, if you wanna bring them to workshops, make sure that there's sugar on the table. Uh, of some kind, or beer, or whatever your corporate allows, right? So um, it's, it's, it's inclusion, I think, would probably be the biggest word. It's just including them in that process. Don't, and make sure, like, eventually, that invitation should be one, it shouldn't even be an invitation, it should be an expectation, right? Inclusion is not, hey, outsider, come here to this party, right? I'm hosting you, it shouldn't be a hosting. What it really needs to be about is we're on the same team, we're both responsible for the quality of the experience and I need you to understand that as well. Help me help our customers, right? And that, that's how I try to talk about it. Super. Can you put up the last slide with the URL? Because some of us missed that too fast. And let's thank Dave for an inspirational introduction to design ops. Whew. Oh, come on. I, I have, I've been live tweeting the meeting as I often do, ah. so I would like to have a URL for my final tweet for your section. And then I'm gonna introduce Mary. And somebody said, how do you know Mary? And I thought, I can't remember how to know Mary. Did we meet at She's Geeky a million years ago, maybe? Yeah, that's, I, I'll, I'll pretend that was the right one. Yeah, yeah. Oops. So, uh, Mary and I have been talking <coughs> for a long time. We've been friends and so on. But I knew that she was really getting involved in this new effort to understand data privacy. And I thought when I uh, decided to take on this responsibility of the program chair, Mary was one of the people I thought of because I would love to hear in public what she's been working on with data privacy. But when we finally got to it, what we realized is she had to solve a whole bunch of other problems first before she could get at that one thing that she really was hoping to solve initially. And tonight we're going to get to hear a little piece of that long story. This is like a five-year story, seven-year story, something like that. So uh, we had hoped to also have a launch for her website, but small team, somebody had an accident in the car, luckily they're okay, but they took a few weeks off to recover. So expect this launch at the end of the month. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. Yeah. Mary, take so it away. So can you, can you hear me since the microphone was turned off? Okay, now I can hear it. Um, so I, yes, this is a, a long shaggy dog story, which I'm not going to share all the details about, but um, Nancy has periodically heard about this project that I've been working on for, I've actually been a part of this group, IDESG. I am going to try to whip us past the acronyms um, quickly in one slide, uh, but IDESG is the group that I've been involved with for the past seven years. And uh, so, um, but there's a, but what I really wanna do is share the project, the development that we've been doing, show you the design work that we're doing around this. And actually, I think I'm just gonna pull this over here so I don't crash into it. Um, so, uh, so how did I get here? So I'm not really an identity person, but IDESG stands for Identity Ecosystem Steering Group. And so most of the folks who are in that group, it started out with about 400 people because it was an Obama-announced uh, NSTIC principal project group. Um, and so, of course, everybody clamored in, and many of those people were identity experts. I'm not. I've learned a lot about identity systems since I started working on this, but what I really care about is personal data control because I like privacy. Um, and, and I'm guessing that everybody here has at least some affinity for privacy because you're all wearing clothes. Um, so even for the people who say privacy is dead and like to quote uh, 
Mr. McNally from Sun Microsystem. I'm blinking on his first name. Um, Scott McNally, McNeely, um, McNally, whatever. Uh, you know that you you still believe in some measure of this. So um, so I got involved peripherally because I am a usability engineer, as often what I'm called. Um, I actually went to the information school at Berkeley. Um, in fact, with Allison, um, we were in the same class many many, many years ago, uh, and uh, too long. <laughs> and, uh, and I just care about, I, what I was concerned about when this group formed was that with all these folks clamoring in from all sorts of different organizations, privacy groups, uh, you know, big companies and whatnot, and, and all the government folks, was that the users were gonna get screwed. And who are the users in the United States? It's pretty much everybody. So, um, so I'm going to just kind of take you through the story about how we ended up um, doing what we're doing now, which I think actually seven years later is incredibly interesting. Um, so my contact information is on the bottom and some information got cut off, but don't worry about it. Basically, uh, Nancy gave me this title and it is pretty reflective of, of what has happened um, for me and now I've ended up leading the product team at IDESG. So let me, okay. So first of all, um, there's, I'm gonna use some terms um, and I just wanna make sure that um, folks are familiar with them. I'm sure that you have some idea of what an identity is, but what we mean it is about our users, individuals, people. Um, folks in security sometimes think that uh, um, identity and ID information or users can mean the machine. We, we're not talking about that. We're talking about real people. Um, personal data is, um, you know, this is one uh, definition. Attributes, credentials, those are the kinds of things that we, when we look at a system using our system, um, which I'm gonna explain to you in a little bit, um, you know, those are, those are important things. Um, so they, those terms may come up. Um, so here's the nasty acronym page. Um, so what are we? Well, we are IDESG, uh, the Identity Ecosystem Steering Group. And what does that mean? Well, that was the name that NIST, which is part of the Department of Commerce, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, funded our program. Um, what they called our group after Obama and the uh, Department of Commerce announced the NSTIC principles, that being the National Strategy for Trusted Identity in Cyberspace. Does anyone call it cyberspace? No. But uh, that started a um, uh, long time ago. The Commission on Cybersecurity from 2008 gave you know a long um, paper on this, and in, ultimately in 2011, NSTIC was announced. NIST, which has been around forever, doing standards and technology. Um, work uh, created IDESG, funded it. We created this thing called the IDEF, Identity Ecosystem Framework. So what we really care about is the framework. So this organization with 400 volunteers began work on a framework um, and we ultimately published the first version in 2014. And by 2016, we, reali we had created and, and realized the vision of having a registry. So what's a registry? It sounds so boring, like we're all gonna register. Uh, it's not for individuals to register. <clears throat> it's about products and services. So um, I'm sure you've heard the term certification. Um, it often comes up in health, finance. Um, there's certification programs. They're based on a set of requirements. It's all incredibly boring, except that it's a lot about control and getting uh, entities, products, and, and their services to meet a certain level of standard. So actually, it's really cool. Um, and then the last thing, of course, that I'm gonna talk about is ratings, um, because that's where we're ultimately ending up um, with this project. So um, we worked on the framework for two years. Um, what's different about it is that we don't just cover security, like uh, the NIST, um, 863.3 is their new version, but .2, folks might be familiar with that. Um, these are standards that, um, you know, lots of security um, organizations need to meet. 
so that uh, uh, people who might buy their ser services or products are, you know, they know that they've, they've met this minimum level of security. But we add privacy, usability, and interoperability in there. And that, that really was unique. It came out of the NSTIC principles, which asks for ease of use and uh, data privacy and uh, interoperability so that the information can traverse networks. Um, a really cool thing that many companies really aren't a big fan of because they love lock-in. Um, but we, we created that. So, um, you know, we know that, um, that this differentiation with privacy, usability, and interop won't last because the GDPR exists. And so now more organizations are looking at increasing those um, requirements. But nonetheless, um, you know, we looked at, at these things. I'm sure you've seen that photo uh, on user experience and design. Um, in fact, it might even be in Christian's book. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, these were the important things that we were, we were looking at beyond the usual security requirements. So, um, and this is my favorite best practices um, stuff, um, especially the part about removing the child before washing and for worst results, drag through a puddle behind a car, blow dry on the roof rack. Um, anyway, so we, you know, <laughs> have to have a bit of levity in this really um, otherwise uh, serious chat about um, ratings and systems. Anyway, so what really makes our system unique, our requirements unique, is our individuals. We have both individuals who volunteered in creating the requirements best practices, supplemental guidance, all that stuff that um, an entity has to do if they want or look at if they want to. Currently, we do self-attestation. We're looking at third-party certification and then, and then ratings. But um, so basically, as, as I mentioned, businesses do care about certifications and they do, they do mean something. So for example, the Cloud Security Alliance created a certification system. It's not technically required. But if you want to be a provider in any kind of cloud service, you need to be self-certified and third-party certified with the Cloud Security Alliance set of requirements. So that was the kind of thing that we were looking at here. But the difference is that we wrote all of our requirements from the individual's perspective. So that means what, what, does, an, what does a person care about in terms of what they need for security, privacy, interop, usability? So that's the really the, the radical aspect of our framework. Okay, so we have those 400 people. We created these requirements. Um, and uh, we had this funding from NIST. And then we decided to make, we, we moved on to the next part of the project, which was building the registry. So um, two years ago, I was on the board of this organization. And we were quite, well, we have been quite well funded by, by NIST. Um, and I led the product development and put in actually probably 600 volunteer hours on that product, for which I was not paid, for which Ed was, um, who's over there <laughs> smirking, uh, was not really too happy to see me put in all that free time. So I've since stepped off the board and now I'm leading the product development and paid for that work. Um, but um, what I want to take you through is the, the process, the inter iteration. And in fact, I love your, uh, your examples around agile development and your talk about it because um, I have to compare that to the way that I think about tomatoes. What does tomatoes have to do with any of this? Well, I think of myself as a tomato lover because I think I like maybe two to 5% of the tomatoes on the planet. I like the heirloom kind that you pull right off the vine and you eat and they just, it tastes amazing. I don't like the kind that have been picked for two weeks and sent to, to the store in the truck with the, you know, ethyl gas and all that, and it just tastes like mealy mush. Um, but I think of myself as a tomato lover, so when I think of agile, I think of myself as, you know, someone who loves agile development and who loves to make it work right. And, uh, and I brought it to IDESG. Nobody there knew what it was. They'd never heard of it. There was just, you know, zero in, this is in 2016, if you can believe it. Um, zero recognition of it and a lot of skepticism. So the folks at NIST in particular were like, what is this Agile thing? And uh, while the Agile team was meeting every day, 
five days a week. We would meet once a week with volunteers from IDESG and the NIST representatives who had funded us. And, um, you know, every week I would get the question from the lead at NIST saying, now what is this agile thing and why are we using it? And, you know, justify yourself and what's going on here. And, uh, and by the end of the project, he was able to describe how it worked, what was great about it, and two years later, we recently had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with a bunch of folks who had come in to look at the project and look at how we had spent ultimately about $10 million over the last seven years. And uh, I was on this call, but it was a conference call where all of a sudden there was background noise for me. And the question was asked, how did you develop this and what have you done? And David Temeshock, who is a NIST person, stepped up. This is my main skeptic, the person that I had to battle every week two years ago, and explained exactly how Agile worked in the in the two to five percent version that you know that you're celebrating in your book, and did a beautiful job and talked about how great it was to have this process with a virtual team. <coughs> Um, folks from all over the place um, working on this and how well it had worked and how much we were iterating and learning and, and all of that. So our team um, is kind of all over. We have a number of different folks. Early adopter is our development shop, but they also do some design work and they do project management within the development group. Um, we have Noreen Weasel, who some of you may be familiar with. She speaks a lot at conferences. Um, and as our usability lead. Um, at the time, two years ago, we had a designer in Atlanta. We had a bunch of IDESG support. We have a concierge for the, the registry to help entities come in because it's a very complicated system when you have a set of requirements uh, that, that need to be met. And, uh, and of course, a complicated registry too. Um, and then I was on the board leading the product. Um, and so we did, down here, way at the bottom, we did 16 weeks of um, two-week builds in an agile format. And everybody else learned it. I actually, to be honest, I think Noreen understood agile development and I think our development team, it was everybody at IDESG that just had a lot of problem with it and thought it was, you know, this is a Washington DC centric volunteer organization and you know, I was the weirdo from Silicon Valley who wanted to do these strange things with agile development. Anyway, so um, what did we build? We built, this is phase one. Um, this is the front of the site, which is what you would see if you go there right now. It's idefregistry.org. Um, so our assumption was that people were gonna come and register their products. Not a good assumption. Um, so we assumed that, uh, that they would come and they would see this. You see, this is the welcome page. They would read this little introduction and they would, you know, go through the registration process. But in fact, what they really wanted to do was browse registrations that had already happened, look at what it looked like, see what it was, see what the requirements were like, think about the attestation requirements, uh, because there's, you know, it has its own terms of use and, you know, what is it going to mean for their business and all of that. Um, and then they might think about doing this. So we had buried the lead. We had flipped what we were supposed to be doing, right? But we were so in it that we didn't see it. Um, I'm sure you've all been on more than one project where that kind of thing has happened. So we launched with about nine registrants. We don't have a whole lot more right now, but, um, and partly that's because as a volunteer org, with a very much an alpha site, you know, we've, it's friends and family. Um, but all the folks who registered do something in identity, um, but they're in a variety of industries. So Digicert is a certificate provider. Um, Tosni is a, an authenticator. You know, these are, all the, these are all entities that play some kind of a role in the chain of identity services that a company might uh, purchase for the background and then it looks like they're the, you know, they have their own identity system, but really it's all kind of services that they get from other entities. So, um, you know, basically the assumption in this version is that it's B2B or B2G, business to business, business to government providers. Anyway, so the thing that I really want you to look at is this. So this is our scoring system. 
and you probably can't see this, but this is 44 out of 76 fully implemented, 4 out of 76 implementation underway, 26 out of 76 under consideration, and 2 out of 76 not applicable or not under consideration, and a fair amount of green and some other colors. And then this one is not that green, some other numbers out of 77, but a lot of orange. So does anybody know what that means? Nobody knew what this meant. We, we had, we, we, do have, we did have visualization, and green is good. Green is a good thing, right? So you could scan the list of, of entities, and you could say, well, there's, you know, there's some green ones, and somehow are all green, and isn't that great? And maybe we should look at that company, because you know, they've done very well against the requirement set. But it wasn't very simple. Right, it was complicated. People looked at those scores and they're like, I don't know what that means, that's insane. Um, you know, so we had to really redo our design. So we, um, with our next round of funding, we realized we were really gonna have to do a design treatment. So here's a, an easier version actually to read. Um, it was really hard. The pie charts um, didn't give a good representation because the, the base score was always different. You know, the 177 versus 76, what is that? Uh, anyway, it was confusing, all of that. So anyway, um, we had a lot of issues. Um, but the good news was we had spent a lot of money on usability testing with the folks who registered, prospective registrants, and folks who were sort of in the industry. And we collected a lot of information and had a, a lengthy list of stuff that we wanted to address. Um, Noreen did a fantastic job um, with usability, and in fact, she does freelance work. If anybody's looking for somebody to do a project, she is really the bomb. And she really convinced NIST that this was money well spent because at the beginning, they didn't want to spend any money on usability work. And I set up a budget, and uh, they, they thought that I mean, they have only ever built websites that had design a designer with a bunch of engineers, and that's it, maybe a project manager. And um, if you go to NIST's website, you'll see the result of that um, wonderful planning. <laughs> so anyway, we look, there's a lot of things that we, uh, we realized, you know, that were hard to use or that needed, um, needed help. So, um, so we really needed to clean up and we needed to evolve our design as I mentioned, we had, um, we had buried the lead. Um, so what we started out with was a bit more usability testing um, around some design ideas, simplifying our navigation. We did a chalk mark survey that was fairly uh, intensive. We did two versions of it, collected in information architecture ideas uh, and feedback. Um, and uh, so this is our old site on the bottom, this lower part but we showed people this navigation in our second round of testing. So you get a, a sense of you know, where we were going. Um, what we ultimately ended up with was a little bit different than this, but um, anyway, let me show you a bit more. So, uh, oh, and then um, we did this thing called the design challenge. So we put a significant amount of money into, um, into saying we want our designers to focus strictly on the mark and that scoring and symbol issue. Um, we really want to address that, that piece of this. So we made it a whole separate part of the project with its own usability budget and everything. So that was the, the main scope of work. So we developed a new front page that kind of tried to give a flavor of what we were doing. Um, for example, um, we came up with this thing, future proof positive, so there's the concept of identity proofing. That's where you get back to those credentials and attributes about people. Um, but we wanted it to be you know, positive. There's a typo, forget that. This is just a mock-up. Um, we have uh, you know, various um, vision for different um, kinds of individuals, identity providers, any organization, to be able to come in and understand why should you do this? Why should you follow? Essentially, the requirements can be treated like a roadmap. Here's how to build a good system for usability, security, privacy, and interop um, from an individual's um, what perspective for what they care about. 
So we tried to emphasize, you know, this is, this is the future. This is the guy who's just, you know, he's hanging out and he's, he's, um, he's proofed, he's in a suit. Um, so the front page now explains, you know, what it is that we're doing and, and why somebody might care about this, um, which is a sort of a different take. Um, we also um, redid aspects of the registry. So before we had four steps, we iterated to five. We clarified this stuff. Um, we made it easier, um, more simple um, to submit information. Um, and really easy for people to go and do the last thing, which of course on the other version we forgot, which is whenever you want, you can check your status uh, as you're in process. And um, you know, again, when you're deep in it, you forget about that at any point in the process, somebody might want to see where they are. So you can always click on that, that last uh, tab and, and see that. So um, this is an example of the requirements. Um, Basically, uh, we have the supplemental guidance thing that's quite extensive. Um, the requirements are shorter. They, they tend to be you know, really clear and say, you, know, you must do this stuff, right? Must versus may, may being a best practice. Um, and what we found in the usability testing was that nobody was looking at the supplemental guidance because it was a click away. And they already had enough complicated stuff to deal with. So we simplified from six columns down to three, um, made it really easy to understand. And whenever you're on a requirement, the supplemental guidance shows so that you can know whether or not you're on the right track. Because what we realized is, is that when somebody's answering the requirement question, we want them to be really sure that their interpretation of those words is our interpretation of those words. Seems obvious, but again, um, we missed that the first time around. Um, we also consolidated our knowledge base. So this is a page um, currently under development um, for our launch in two weeks, but basically um, what we're doing here is making a hierarchical representation that shows all the documents that consist um, together as the framework. Um, so just simplifying things, making it easy to understand. And in fact, actually, um, let me just show you real quick a, uh, to give you a sense of our requirements. Um, so this is what we currently have at IDESG.org, kind of a bunch of boring documents. Um, and if you click through, you can read the requirements. You can see they're relatively short. These are the interop requirements. Here's an example of Privacy One um, with the supplemental guidance, you know, and, and what we really wanted people to see is, you know, there's more to this. It's complicated. Um, we want people to build and evaluate themselves or when we do third party evaluation to do it correctly um, and to see the references. So, um, for example, on, um, here's an usability, oops, that's a, here we go. Here's a usability requirement. So um, entities conducting digital identity management functions must apply user-centric design. Seems obvious, right, for everyone here. I mean, you would want things to be um, user-centric, and we define what we mean by that. Um, using uh, good guidelines and practices um, to all of the interfaces, communications, you know, everything that um, their service or product um, uh, is addressing, but um, we give this little bit of supplemental guidance and then we built a, re a resources page. And I'm sure you're most, you know, many of you would be very familiar with a lot of those resources. Um, but the idea is that, um, you know, we really wanted them to see that that information was important and to incorporate it in, uh, let's see, how do I go back to, this. I think I just go here. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Let me see if I can go here. Back to. Okay, so again, much of the same team came back and we worked in the agile process um, or method 
um, hopefully in the two to five percent version. Um, that's really great. Uh, and um, we used all the usability learnings that we had from before and we continue to collect. And in fact, we're collecting now for our next grant application um, to look at ratings. Um, and so let me show you some of the design stuff that uh, was developed for the design challenge and then I'll jump to the ratings piece. So a um, little bit uh, light there, but this was the first iteration of looking at new set of icons for um, privacy, usability, security, interop. Um, this is what we've ended up with. Um, and these tested very well with people. They were crisper and um, more clear and it was obvious what was what. Um, you know, security, privacy, uh, usability and interop in that order go across and then these other icons, you know, can be used as needed. Um, when we started looking at, at how to do the, um, the score, we thought, well, what if we just went with green and we, you know, and we have these, you know, we do a scale, red or, you know, orange. We do actually have red at the bottom. I don't think I have any red to show you, but red, orange, yellow, and then light green and dark green. Um, and a score, but then we got back from the users like well, what is 7.5? Is it like 7.5 out of 100 or 7.5 out of 9 or 10 or you know, what do you mean? So um, we played around with that. Um, we also looked at averaging the symbols and then also having a fly out that would um, give you the you know, the individual scores But again same issue around the numbers um, so usability testing led to um, some more work, um, you know, these are different variations. This one is important because we started to mock up what it would look like if you were signing up or logging in using an ex, you know, using basically uh, an identity provider that you would bring to a relying party. Again, jargony language, but um, relying parties are the entities that might take your Facebook login or your Twitter login. This is an example of that, so IDEF registered with some scores and a sign up. And the idea is that, uh, you know, wh how, what, would a, what would an end user do if they came across those kinds of scores? Would they think this was good, bad, ugly? You know, what, what was it? Well, ultimately what we learned there is, is that they don't really know what to make of it unless they can compare. So we did a bit more iteration. We started looking at flyouts. Those tested very well. Um, and people started to get a better context. Six out of seven fully implemented. Okay, that, that looked pretty good. And percentages, people know that. They know percentages are gonna be out of 100, so that was good. Um, so here's an example of um, you know five out of seven. You can click through and see the details of their scoring. Um, so we got um, close to this sort of a thing. You can see the icons represent the later version. Um, so here's where we got a lot of positive um, feedback. So um, we are not at the Washington Post. We just mocked this up so that people would have a sense of something that they might actually go to. Um, but the idea is that um, this person has moused over this score, which is hidden underneath here, and this is what they're saying. That's the flyout. Um, this doesn't represent uh, the, the percentages yet, but you get the idea. You're starting to see the comparison. Um, but if entities only self-certify, we're probably never going to get Facebook and Amazon until we get a massive amount of critical mass, um, which is not going to come for a while. So we started to look at, um, at ratings. So think about consumer reports. They don't go and ask Maytag if they can you know, uh, evaluate that washer. They just buy the washer and evaluate it against all the other washers and you see a score and you see some information about it. This resonated um, very well because it's a very simple green check mark. So what would you choose if you were going to log into this site? Um, what we found is that people really like the green check marks and they don't want to use any red X's. Um, so now we're starting to create market pressure because it's just in time information and, it, and the person is actually given something that they can use and react to and then just move on and they're done. 
so um, again, um, the flyout and the percentages is where, where we landed. Um, okay, so um, what we realized is, is that we really needed to go out for grants um, around a rating system. Um, and uh, we uh, are doing testing right now that incorporates gathering information that we can actually use in those grant applications. So it, it'll be for the future build, but we can say we learned X, Y, and Z about how users need to interact with ratings in certain circumstances, and we want you to fund us to build it and to evangelize it and get it located at particular sites or apps or in certain circumstances. So um, we also looked at potential business models because we are a nonprofit, we need to be sustainable. Um, and I think it's only fair to talk about how we would be sustainable because you certainly don't want to sell out your users or whatever. We want to be on the same side of the table as our users. So these are the kinds of things that we're we're looking at, um, but no pay to play. That's kind of, I should have made that bigger there in the lower right hand corner. Um, that's a really important thing. Nobody can come in and either control the requirements or you know, no entity, no large company, and we make it so that, um, so that these ratings are trusted as much as they can be. Everything, every system has bias, every algorithm has bias. Knowing that, what's the best we can do? Can we create something that can help people when they're choosing you know, what to do. So ultimately, um, we saw this as a design challenge. And again, to the, the point around agile development, um, and maybe the reason why I, I think of myself as like the tomato lover who loves agile too, is because um, we, I always set up all my projects so that product in, and design and usability actually run everything. And then the engineers come in later and build stuff with us. And um, they have full access to all the research and the design decisions and they understand what we're doing. So um, it's been a pretty successful model and we did it here and, uh, and I think, you know, we've, what we're developing is, you know, is turning out to be pretty good. We're getting a lot of good uh, marks in our testing and whatnot. Um, so uh, nobody else does ratings like this um, in a top-down way. I mean, there's, at every site you can go and see what the user said. But to apply a framework in that consumer reports manner, which they don't share their framework. Our framework is totally public, as I showed you. Um, I think will make it really interesting. And then the other thing is one of our usability requirements is that user input is collected. So for example, users have to be polled on an annual basis about whether or not they think that a particular product is easy to use. And if a minimum percentage isn't met, then they don't get that requirement with a good mark. So um, anyway, uh, what we're looking forward to in the future is um, you know, the ways that we could look at so sectors, health, finance, children's products, um, or consumer generally, having a really simple way to communicate um, the, the scoring, the, the results. Um, I did forget to mention, because um, I mentioned our numbers. So when we started, we had 400 people, or 400 entities that were really involved in IDESG. And when we did phase two, we had about 60. And then there was a period where the board sort of trailed off for a year and we lost a lot of folks. Um, and it's interesting, our board considers this to sort of be this terrible flaw. What I think was really cool is that the 15 people that stayed, we have a privacy expert, we have a security expert, um, or two security experts, we have um, um, identity experts, we have usability, product, engineering, um, design, we actually ended up with the right 15 people in the room. So I consider it a huge win that we got rid of all the cruft and we're actually making something of value. Um, and so I said this on one of our board calls um, recently and the board was a bit flummoxed because again, Washington DC crowd, they were sort of like, could that possibly be? And I think from a Silicon Valley perspective, from my perspective, having made startups, 
you know, getting the right 15 people in the room can be incredibly valuable. And it can get you to the place where you're on the good trajectory. And I feel like we're finally there. Um, so we're, um, we're working on grants to, uh, that's our next step, is to go out with a, a professional grant writer and go to Ford Foundation, Markle for Health, Ford for Children's Programs, um, Omidyar and uh, MacArthur and whatnot for financial and general consumer. Um, but what we want is the funding to really, you know, make this and create the APIs that would allow these to be, you know, these ratings to be called um, and uh, to really build out a professional program that's still a neutral, you know, nonprofit driven service. So anyway, that's what we're doing. Hopefully that wasn't too, too serious. <laughs> Just serious enough. Okay, questions for Mary. Don't all speak at once, okay. Thank you for the talk. I wanted to ask, why was the decision to mix usability, security, and privacy, like these four components? So um, remember that this started with the Commission on Cybersecurity um, back in 2008. And in their initial reports, um, you know, this was a very Washington, D.C., but kind of high-level industry group um, that still exists. In fact, right now they had they have a new report that advises Trump and it's very business focused because I think that they know that's what would appeal. Um, but they, they created that. Then they asked in a bunch of um, identity and personal data experts um, and I was one of those people who joined um, that started on the end stick principles and you know it was kind of a community driven thing. I think they wanted to pull people in and so you know, I'm kind of remembering back to 2009, 10, 11, when, you know, the assumptions were made that, you know, there's security issues, but there's all, but we're not really addressing the ease of use issues for individuals. We don't need them to understand everything about security, and they're never going to understand all about, you know, everything their device does, and maybe all the leaky holes that exist in the background. Um, for example, but but if if the products or the whatever the solutions are that come out are easy to use, then this is a good principle to put into the end stick principles. So we started with that, and then when we went to make the framework and the requirements, we decided this it made a lot of sense to cover these areas to ask for ease of use so, and you know the data privacy issues and other things that haven't been in prior systems. It evolved over time and I wasn't there at the very beginning of the decision making. Just to understand it more, so the usability focuses on general product usability, not about how you engage with about data privacy or security issues. So the requirements do overlap. For example, a security requirement that would ask for data security would still apply to the data privacy elements and to the usability elements and vice versa. So uh, if there's a request that things are easy to use and there's a security element to the product, if the user touches it, right, so that's the if, because a lot of security things happen in the background, but if the user is touching it, let's say it has to do with password development or something, it needs to be easy to use and understandable for the end user because they're touching it and it's they're interacting with it. So that's the that's the idea is that these things overlap and that you know we're asking for uh, you know if you use it as a roadmap. So I guess I could also say you know regarding the requirements, um, they're written on the build, you know, towards the build side, right? They're, they're compound requirements. Um, and that's typically something that's done for engineers, right? Engineers want to see, like, give me the whole scope, and then I'll just build for that whole thing. Um, and that makes sense, but then you have the audit side, right? So that would be the stick side of this whole program versus the carrot side. So um, the stick side is you, you might get audited. Did you do all the stuff? Well, now it's a checklist, right? But it's the same requirements, just phrase by phrase, broken out, essentially. 
Um, so we recognize that that is also, is also an issue, but the idea is if ease of use is asked for whenever the user touches something, it doesn't matter if it's in security, a data privacy issue, um, an interop issue, that things be easy to use for the end user. So how did the, this new upcoming privacy regulations have impacted your work? The GDPR. GDPR and uh, in Canada changes now happening mm -hmm. and the uh, California privacy, consumer privacy regulations yeah. are coming. How does it, does it impact it? So How we haven't, it? we haven't looked closely at the California requirements yet because you're talking about the initiative that's on the ballot in the fall. Yeah, I mean, I kind of assume it will pass because people like privacy, but we don't know for sure and it's not in force yet. But what we have looked at is GDPR comparisons. We've mapped our set of requirements to US-centric um, requirement sets, and now we're working on mapping it to the GDPR. But there is a little bit different focus there. Um, there's a number of things that the GDPR covers that we don't, and vice versa. You know, it, it's, so we want to make it something so that if uh, ultimately, um, somebody is compliant with a particular system that we're able to say, okay, if you're 100% compliant with the GDPR, you're 75% compliant with our system, now just look at these remaining 25% 25, 25 of the questions, of the requirements, um, so that it's really easy for people to come in. Um, but that said, we're very much in sync philosophically. It's very much, um, you know, the idea is to give the end user control which um, in our research is what we find when we talk to people about privacy issues. They really want control over their information. I'm never gonna make Mary Hotter um, private or just my name. There's hundreds of other Mary Hotters on the planet, right? But the complete arrangement of my information, my address, my phone number, uh, my email information, you know, that arrangement of information is unique to me and maybe some credentials and attributes thrown in. Um, and so, at, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a continuum, right, about how, when does the information really become very specific to me? And it doesn't take very many attributes to get there. Um, in fact, usually it takes two, um, maybe three. So it's, I mean, we're remarkably exposed. But um, nonetheless, uh, we want to make it so that you know, if somebody's in, adherent to our system and they're philosophically in aligned, that they can easily, you know, go back and forth to other systems. And that's been the approach that we've taken, so. The, you mentioned that uh, from 400 uh, kind of companies that participated, there uh, was very few left. So from your perspective, what do you think, what is the obstacle for companies to have this goodwill and say, hey, we actually care about you consumers? Yeah, well, so, you know, I mean, companies have a much shorter trajectory um, for when they need to see results for something that they participate in, right? So if they go to Oasis or IEEE or somewhere, ACM, and they want to work on a standard, um, you know, they need to start to see results much sooner. To be perfectly frank, the first four years I observed and, and didn't, was it four years? three years, I observed and did not get too involved because there was just too much, you know, it wasn't productive. Um, there were too many people with too many different perspectives with no, without the common language understanding of even just those four terms that I put up there. I mean, I, I just can't sit through another meeting where people are fighting about the definition of identity. I, I don't wanna do it ever, again, ever, ever, ever. So, you know, I kind of stood back and I think other people who just really wanted to build stuff stood back. And as the folks who were, you know, maybe um, trying to have that initial control kind of faded off, I mean, we still can pull them back in and we're certainly pulling in people for testing. We're calling them and saying, hey, you were involved. Can we test what we're building with you? And they're actually really interested. Um, but they, you know, there were, I think it was, there was too much of a lack of definition at the beginning and it was fine that they faded off. It was actually a good thing. And now we have a group of people who are really focused on the product development and I think we can pull those folks back in. Um, they just needed to come for more of a results oriented thing and, you know. It's 
Uh, for me, I draw a parallel to previous speaker about talking, you know, how do you show the value of, like, for example, code design ops, and the same similar here is kind of how mm -hmm. how you do show values to the companies to put in an effort and uh, engage in this activity. So, um, as probably many of you are familiar with, um, whenever you see yourself scored, um, you probably react. Uh, and, and so we think that when companies see the, the rating that they get, that we expect, um, we expect a reaction. We think that at that point that they will pay attention and the market will move towards a more privacy enhancing, security enhancing, usability enhancing model um, than it is right now. And, it's, and they'll come, we think that entities will come and look at the set of requirements and consider it as a roadmap. We're already hearing from about a dozen companies that have said, thank goodness, we didn't know how to build the right way. You, you're showing us, you're giving us that roadmap. Now let's get to building, we'll come back, we'll do the score. Um, you know, this is a really good thing because we can show that we're better, but you're right, that's a really small carrot. I think it's, you know, when we start to show something like this, um, that's when it gets really real. And we think that relying parties like the Washington Post, I mean, they want, they want to show examples with um, something reliable that, you know, is real and weighty, but that can be s as simple as what is here on the screen um, to, to send their users to good actors. Um, because then they can say, hey, we're promoting good actors. And everybody wants to do that at this point, especially after the whole, you know, last year of Facebook fun that we've all been having. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Hi, um, two questions that are tightly related. First is, um, do your requirements borrow heavily from HIPAA? Uh, and two, uh, is it possible for, this is a naive question, could a startup doing social networking uh, register itself as a health information system and then be done with all this? So, um, so we don't currently have um, sectors that we've, we've approached. We've, um, you know, this is where we want to go. So, you know, we expect as we add verticals that we'll add programs that will address health issues. Um, we do have a healthcare committee who, people who participated in building HIPAA, who have been on the Merkle board, which is a health focused data um, nonprofit. Um, we have expertise in that area, and I expect that when, we, you know, health is one of the first things we want to go and do. Um, I expect that, that, that w as that program is built out, it will address what you're talking about. I guess I'm asking something more basic. I thought okay. health is already done. Like, I go to my medical clinic and I sort of tell them everything. And I don't hear anything about them being pulled into any a Senate, whatever, and, and Russia is not invading them or anything of that sort. So, isn't the problem solved for health information yeah. systems? And uh, so, um, you know, to be so, let me just say, I'm not an expert in healthcare systems. That's not my expertise. But the guys who are in our health committee who run it um, feel that actually there's quite a bit of problem for in terms of the service providers that create systems that. Um, medical institutions use. HIPAA is actually really easy to get around. You just make everyone sign everything and you say, you know, us and all of our partners and all of a sudden the data can just flow freely. And so they want a better system. They want something with some controls and, uh, and they feel that, that ratings, uh, even in a B2B context um, for the service providers who provide to healthcare organizations, you know, that it shouldn't just be about security, that you've met 863.3, the NIST standard, you know, in your health org, or you use FICAM, which is another crazy identity standard for, um, that health orgs use, um, you know, that that's not enough, that you really need to consider the individual. Those standards really don't consider the individual. So that's why they're interested in doing it. I just, I just thought that somehow Facebook and all these guys are doing a much worse job than health information systems. Maybe they aren't. I don't know. Um, yes and no. I mean, it's. I think it's complicated, but yeah. Here. Okay. So as the technology moves and changes quite radically, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the speed of it is increasing, 
how are you going to be able to keep up with all the changes in regulations? And even the government doesn't know how to regulate some of these things, right? Yeah. So what is, uh, what is the plan on that? And how do you envision that uh, sync up? So, um, so you're right. Right now, um, pretty much every app provider, uh, Apple notwithstanding, because they have a little bit of a lead time on approving a new product, you know, everybody just uploads the next version, you know, update, update all over the place for all my devices um, all the time. And, you know, w right now we've designed a technology system that is all about the vendors, the, the makers of software and hardware. And what we want to do is actually make them step back and think if they have the set of requirements in advance and the engineering team can build for that that they know every time they do an update to whatever the system or service is that, um, that they're trying to adhere to these requirements. And if they decide to break something, that they know their score is going to go down. And so you're right. Then there's the issue of, well, how do you keep track of those scores? Um, you know, we're, what we're hoping is that we can do something where we just simply show the score on an annual basis. Um, you know, something that would give people a picture of how an entity is doing, and then if they want to come in and uh, and update their score because they actually did better, perhaps or whatnot, that we might be we might be able to develop a system where they could come in and get in the queue, kind of like you submit to Apple, and then Apple reviews your next version of your app, and then it ends up in the Apple Store. You know, and so um, so that might require a, a base fee for um, just doing a, an updated score. Um, you know, it, I mean, these are programs to be developed, but these are the ideas that we've had so far, and we certainly recognize that that's an issue. Because um, obviously, if you're updating twice a week, it's not going to be easy to keep up that score, keep up with the, you know, having a relevant current score. Um, so, yeah. So uh, one qu quick question. Um, and actually, I just found a relevant tweet. It goes, hey, I just met you, and this is crazy, but here's my number, so call me maybe. Terms and conditions may apply, hashtag GDPR. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was wondering if you'd been watching the GDPR process roll out and yeah. a government-sponsored privacy protection service slash super annoying compliance yes. uh, burden. Um, and right. are there lessons from that? Do they do anything right or wrong? Do you interact with that on some level? Like, can you leverage it and say, they're GDPR compliant, therefore they meet some of our requirements, or it's, is it totally out in a different uh, axis from what you're doing? Yeah, so I did mention that we, we want to map to the GDPR and be able to say, you know, if you're compliant with, with our requirements, you know, to make it mappable in both directions. But that said, I mean, this whole thing with the GDPR, like who couldn't be aware of it if, unless you've never signed up for anything? I mean, it was like the most massive unsubscribe um, effort in the history of technology, right, for the last 20 years. Like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize I was subscribed to these 900 things. I'll just unsubscribe to everything. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, the problem is, is the way the GDPR is written right now and the fact that there's very little guidance um, from the EU about how to implement. Um, the only guidance they gave really was you need to update, right, your, your terms, and, terms of use and your consent. Um, and you need to have written consent. And it needs to be you know, more, um, more forward than it has been. And so every company did it. And they did it to everyone on the planet because they don't know where you are. And um, you know, it, it, I don't think it was great. I don't think it was great usability. Um, I think it just annoyed people to an extent. Although I do think many people used it as an opportunity to unsubscribe to a lot of stuff, um, which was actually kind of great. Um, but we have to figure out different ways, better ways to, to do stuff. And honestly, I think um, y you know, using a rating when it's relevant is better than just spamming people with a million email like what happened. Um, but there is this problem with consent. They, need, they have to actually record the consent now. Um, I'm working on another project or have worked on another project. It's a standard at Kantara 
um, which is I think now going up the chain to IEEE to get standardized there for consent receipt, um, which means that you would have the opportunity to look at your consent receipt. Nobody's going to look at these things. They're like 20 um, fields of really boring stuff that um, you don't really need to know. However, if you want to un subscribe rather than waiting for the email you could go and look at like like your cookie list like here's all the oh I don't want to be part of that delete you know and then a signal goes back to the entity and that could be interesting um, it could be a much better way of um, maintaining consents updating consents and you just see it like the cookie list um, which people hardly ever look at but every once in a while it matters um, and that that could be a good way to manage Data and it would be c compliant with our thing, um, but it, it's it's kind of honestly my take on it is it's a bit of a mess and they really need to go to version two and version three, and honestly doing the kind of work that we've done, I think they would. I don't know if they're doing it or not. They they could learn a lot from um, from talking to users and and trying to figure out how to make things um, more user centric than than they they have, you know, so. Well, I'm appreciative, thank you, for your sharing all that with us tonight. Sure. And uh, we, we managed to stick with everybody here, thank you very much. And okay. if you want to comment more to David or to Mary, please come up front and thank you. We'll see you next month. One of the topics we're considering is the whole GDPR thing. And I think it could be interesting to see how the process worked in a couple of different companies. That so that's one of the directions we're planning to go. August is Alan Cooper. And September we'll take the other panel topic that we're not doing next month. So, okay. Thanks, everybody.